why house hacking? Because there, there's like a million different strategies. And I'm mm-hmm. just curious, like what made you choose house hacking? It's just like the easiest way to get in. I mean, at the end of the day, you're able to put down three to 5%. You're able to then ha- have other bedrooms. So you can do it where you, you know, have a duplex, you live on one side and then rent out the other. And that hopefully will cover most of your mortgage. So you live for free. But I'm like, how do I lower my two number one expenses? Number one is the car, right? People have uh, expensive leases on their car. I bought my car outright. So $0. Another big expense is rent. What if I can eliminate rent? And then all that money that I'm saving on rent, I can just, or the mortgage, I can put into savings. So that's what I thought about. Three to five percent down. I don't have to pay for where I live. I have a nice house, and my intention was I could actually live with some cool people because I get to control who moves into the house. So those are my main reasons for uh, yeah house hacking. Got it. Okay. I mean, makes total sense to me. I I didn't personally go the house hacking route because I mean I don't know. I I think and I I encourage the house hacking. It's actually something I'm looking to do coming up. I'm kind of in a situation where I'm moving around a bunch and for me right now, like I'm kind of, I'm just like, I'm comfortable buying properties. So I don't have like, I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't, like, it's not, not, it's not like an, it's an excuse per se, but like, for example, I moved to North Carolina, right? Mm-hmm. And I kind of made the conscious choice of, do I want to live in a prime downtown location or do I want to kind of live a little off, but house hack? I mm-hmm. think for where I was at in my real estate journey, though, I already had a property. So I was already kind of in that mindset. And I, but going forward, like once I find a place to live, I'm like, I tell my girlfriend, we are house hacking. We're going to live in one unit, rent out the other. But I also think that most importantly for a new investor who's all, who's afraid of risks and all these things, like house hacking is such a no brainer way to start because you just, lower your expense you need a place to live anywhere a- anyway you're gonna be paying rent and the fact that you can only put down three to five percent is crazy do you have any mm-hmm. resources books anything for someone who's like i want to learn more about this house hacking thing i've heard of it but for just something- sure yeah um craig curlop that's my guy okay. uh i had him on the podcast as well he wrote a book with bigger pockets called i believe the house hacking strategy so guys go check that book out um another book it's a little bit less known but really helped me because this book taught me and actually he was based in arizona his name is ben something ben l and i think it was called luxury house hacking which this was a concept that was interesting because a lot of people well, maybe you have this belief that if i'm gonna buy a house hack it's got to be you know maybe a, a um, out in the outskirts it can't be that nice of a home but his strategy, which is the same strategy I use, is, all right, get a nice house. Get it in a decent location. It could be $600,000. But here's the thing. Make sure it has a detached casita or detached ADU unit, which means an additional dwelling unit. Yeah. And so those I actually put on Airbnb. So that's covering. That's like bringing in $2,000 a month. Right. That's covering most of your mortgage, maybe half your mortgage in today's rates. And then you still have four, five, six bedrooms in the main house. So you're able to cash flow like crazy and live in a nice area in a nice home. So I'll say those two books and then Growth House Podcast, I got to plug myself for that one. We have a bunch of stories about people house hacking as well. Okay, sweet. I love that. So for your first house hack, what, was it a single family house or was this like a multi-unit property? Mm. Yeah, my first house hack was um, four bedrooms in the main house and then had a, a casita, detached casita. And then we added another bedroom in the house as well. So it turned into a five and then additional dwelling unit. Okay, cool. What would you say to people who are like, Jesse, dude, I'm not, I'm not living with five other people. Like I, for, like, I don't know five people that I would want to live with. And I'm not, <laughs> yeah. you know, what, what would you say to that? Yeah, it's funny. Cause at first that was the main concern. And then at the end of the day, if you vet the right way, then you create a, you create an environment where it doesn't feel like it's crowded with people. Most people are working. So you're not at the house all day running into people. Like, I think that's a misconception that a lot of people have. And also with us, we just have guidelines. Hey, no uh, personal belongings in the common areas. So if you walk through any of my houses, any time of the day, you'd be like, does anyone live here? Like, no joke. I've had people say, 
who lives here? Does anyone live here yet? I'm like, yeah, we have six people living here. They're like, who? Like, can't be guys. I'm like, all guys in one of this, in this house. They're like, what? So it, it is funny because that is a common, and not everyone does it this way. So yes, most likely if you're moving into a house with six people, it's going to be a zoo. But just with the people that we have, they're working professionals. They're people who, you know, understand the concept of clean, safe, quiet. That's kind of our motto for this overall co-living. So if you have the right people in the house, it doesn't feel like you're running on top of each other. Yeah, that, that's, that's super interesting. The other thing, when, when I tell people, like when I hear those things from people, like I don't want to live with other people. I don't want to like, I don't want this. I always come, it always comes back to me that like, you have to give up something. I, and I, I believe in that. I, I want to hear your thought mm-hmm. on this. Like you, you explained how the way that you structured it and you set the expectations up front, everyone like no stuff in the common room and you kept it super clean. But the fact that you had to give up the fact that you're not going to have 110% privacy. Like if you're walking through a hall or whatever, you're probably going to see somebody or I don't know how the bathroom mm-hmm. situation works. You might have to share a bathroom for a little bit or whatever the case may be. But I don't know. I, I talked to so many rookies, like people who haven't started yet. And I, mm-hmm. I was in this too, so I understand where they're coming from. But now that I wouldn't call myself a, you know, a full-on pro. I'm always still learning, but you're seasoned, Bailey. You're seasoned. I'm see. I got some seasoned <laughs> on me. I got some 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 salt and pepper. But um, I don't know. It's like number one. I'm always like, you got to give up something. And then yeah. the second thing that I always that always hits me is, you are. What if it doesn't work out? What if this? And I'm always like, you literally have very little money right now, and you're in already not the greatest situation. So I always come back to. What's the downside to what's going to happen versus what is mm. the upside to it? I'm curious to how, how you yeah. think and, and from a lot of like the, like the rookie types of investors, which we were all at at one point. Like 100%. How you process with those people. I think this is a topic I haven't talked about much. Let's dive into this because it's really, it is so true. And it is a mindset shift because at the end of the day, guess what? I still live with my friends. Like I right. actually enjoy it. I'm 30 years old, I'm financially free. I got you know, plenty of passive income coming in. I don't need to live with someone, but I'm like, I actually now enjoy it. And I'm from the thought and from the school that I had a roommate in college. This is my guy, my day one, but man, it was chaos. So that's just one person. So after I graduated college, I literally moved to a studio apartment and lived there for like four years by myself. And anyone who asked me like, dude, why do you just live in a studio by yourself? I'm like, I hate roommates. Literally, that was my go to quote, I hate roommates. So I've experienced both. And yes, you have your own privacy um, when you have a studio by yourself. But also, I would not be on a podcast with you. I would not be able to go travel to Europe for three months and not really have to worry about finances or cash flow coming in if I didn't freaking buy that house and live with four other people for one year in that house, one year in another house. I spent two years, a big sacrifice, living with some cool people that I actually got to vet and make sure they're cool that I would want to live with. That's the huge sacrifice that allowed me my freedom. So that's, if you don't have a mindset where you can sacrifice two years living with some other people, then it's not for you. Maybe financial freedom is not for you. So I think it's really a mindset shift. The only caveat I will say, if you have kids, totally understand. If you have kids, then look at a triplex, duplex, quad, whatever, where you can actually have a unit to yourself. I get that. But if even if you're a couple, go get the master bedroom with the private bath. You still have three, four other rooms that people can share. Like, it's not that big of a deal. It is an investment in yourself. And it's just that it's a mindset shift for sure. 